Hey guys, welcome back to uh, Data with Dominic. Today uh, we are starting a new playlist or series and we will be focusing on PySpark, which is basically a Python based API for the popular Apache Spark uh, big data framework. So this series will run concurrently along with our SQL server or uh, transact SQL playlist that has already begun and we will be releasing videos on a daily basis for both of these series that are currently running. We urge you to subscribe to our channel and like our videos so that you can so that we can continue making noteworthy content for you and you can uh, grow your knowledge in the data space. So let's begin with today's topic which will be an introduction to PySpark. We won't be getting into the extreme uh, nitty gritty technical details but rather we will be looking at uh, what it is why we need it, how it works, how we use it, and its positioning in the data landscape. And along with this, in the next video, before we get into the uh, PySpark demonstrations, we'll be uh, looking at how we can get an environment set up and start practicing for free. So that will be in the next video before we start our in-depth uh, technical guides to the PySpark programming itself. So let's begin with today's concept. Let's uh, so to begin understanding what PySpark is, uh, first you have to basically get an idea of Apache Spark. All right. So have you ever been training like a machine learning data set and realized that the volume of the data that you have been given is far beyond the capabilities of the machine that you were using? Or have you executed an SQL query on a large data set and realized that it's going to take all day to finish executing? So I'm sure many of you working in data would have uh, been in those situations. One option available to you is to try upgrading your machine, but that would be expensive and just a short term fix. What happens when your training data hits millions and millions of rows as it is likely to given uh, our civilization's current affinity towards data. So Apache Spark gives you a much quicker and affordable way to solve these big data problems. How you may ask. So Apache Spark is basically an open source distributed computing framework used for big data loads. All right. It uses, it utilizes in-memory caching and optimized query execution for faster analytical querying against data loads of any size. So we have available to us development APIs in Java, Scala, Python, and R and uh, it supports code reuse across multiple workloads such as batch processing, interactive querying, real-time analytics, machine learning, and graph processing. So if you were aware of very basically what the standard was in big data up to up till now, you would have obviously come across Apache Hadoop and its uh, map reduce methodology. So Apache Spark was created to be an increment to Hadoop uh, and its MapReduce methodology. So one of the challenges to MapReduce is the sequential or multi-step process it takes to run a job. With each step, MapReduce sort of reads data from the cluster, performs operations and writes the results back to the Hadoop uh, distributed file system or HDFS. And because each step requires these read-write operations, MapReduce jobs are very slow and uh, mainly due to the latency of uh, storage disk uh, I.O. Spark was uh, designed to be an improvement or an increment to MapReduce as I have previously stated. But how does it do this? So one of the ways it does this is um, by basically giving us the ability to remove the sequentiality or the um, or it basically allows us to um, uh, operate on big data in a much less sequential manner. So let's just switch, switch over uh, to our whiteboard to give you a better example with the diagrams. So basically, when we had, um, uh, let's say when we had map produce, for map produce, We basically had, suppose we had data files, right? Sort of for this situation, let's look at tables. When these had to be operated on in MapReduce, 
they had to be done sequentially which means each row had to be operated on one after the other after the other and that was a big uh, sort of limitation in terms of its performance and so one of the things that spark solved was that when we came over to spark what we could do now is we could take the same uh, data file we'll discuss more about this what this particular data file is a little later but this particular data file we could sort of cut it into blocks so suppose we had just to keep it simple we had block one and block two and when they weren't dependent on each other we could send each uh, of these blocks to different cluster nodes or different nodes in our cluster cluster node one and same cluster node two and then they could be performed sort of uh, parallelly and then they were brought back together and aggregated once they were both done and similar to that another benefit as well is just that just like we could cut it into blocks suppose we were doing a uh, sort of transformations on a another a uh, file wherein uh, transformations were being done on many columns or fields of this file if they were not dependent on each other you could split them or partition them almost vertically in a sense and still send them to uh, different uh, nodes to be worked on so that is a huge benefit to us again given to us by apache spark and is a distributed computing concepts and now let's just sort of look at uh, what this file was that we were referring to the main programming structure that we work with in uh, spark is an rdd or a resilient distributed data set so these uh, rdds are basically a collection of objects that are spread across a computing cluster but gives us the appearance that we are dealing with a single monolithic entity so again how that would look is if we come back over to the ipad and just erase all this obviously in a cluster we would have like a master node and several worker nodes right So all these would be linked to the master node and we are obviously sitting here using this master node and to us what is available in this master node would be a data file in the form of an RDD alright so this is the RDD but how this RDD works actually is that it is sort of broken up into many many blocks for all the trans uh, transformations that we want to do in each block is sent to a worker node to be worked upon obviously i didn't my, i'm not exactly picasso so excuse the bad drawing but basically this single file is broken down and sent to each worker node to uh, be operated on or get its transformation executed but the important thing is this rdd still gives us the appearance of one single monolithic file when in reality it is spread between these different nodes and it is even stored in these different nodes different parts of this uh, larger RDD are stored in different nodes it sort of is able to present to us the single original file that we were working on at uh, our location in the master node so that is one of the benefits of RDDs and RDDs can be created from uh, flat files you've got SQL databases and you've got no SQL databases and then you've got the cloud as well and other novel uh, storage formats that are becoming mainstream nowadays so now that we've sort of got a brief look 
at um, RDDs or resilient distributed data sets that make up uh, the the base or uh, they are the fundamental building blocks of Apache Spark and its capabilities. We can now start looking at a bit of uh, Spark's architecture and how it works. So basically whenever we are using Spark, we are dealing with a Spark cluster. So a Spark cluster is basically many nodes and we will have within that Spark cluster one driver node, which is always the situation. So we have a driver and then we will have multiple workers, worker nodes. And basically the driver node of the program is running our our driver node in our Spark cluster is running our main program and has a list of transformations that you want to perform on your data. And when this program is executed, the di driver uh, driver node, the one where we are working, creates a Spark context. So this Spark context is created by the driver node when we run our program. So we get a Spark context built, and this is basically an orchestrator and basically this orchestrator which resides in the spark context considers the code that is needed to be executed and determines the tasks that must be created and executed so it generates a physical plan and then uses another cluster manager to orchestrate all the worker nodes and to schedule their tasks and run their tasks. And within the Spark context and within the cluster manager specifically, we have a scheduler called a DAG scheduler. So this is a DAG scheduler and DAG is basically a directed acyclic graph. So what this graph shows us is basically um it it assigns the tasks and shows us the order to execute the tasks by the worker nodes so once the executors in the worker nodes are given the tasks by the dag scheduler so each worker nodes has an executor with tasks so like you got t1 t2 here and then this other worker has another executor T1 and T2 so once these are uh, once the DAG scheduler gives the tasks to the executors within the worker nodes they are dynamically launched by the cluster manager and they run the tasks and once they run the tasks they return the result to the driver node and they are complete and then the data is aggregated and put together back into a single monolithic uh, data store file or data uh, frame depending on what's, what uh, concept you're using or, and what program or what um, transformations you're doing and whether there are any further transformations. So that is a bit about the core Spark engine. So basically when you zoom out, this sort of becomes the core Spark engine this architecture is how the core spark engine works and on top of this core spark engine we have several libraries that allow developers to easily interact with this core engine for specific use cases so one of them is spark sql and spark sql is basically for working with structured data in the form of data frames and another one is spark streaming spark streaming is for 
allowing the ingesting of small data batches or micro batching to achieve near real time data streams. Then we've got mlib or m library, which is to provide distributed uh, machine learning frameworks. And then we've got graphics, which is the final library available to us for distributed graph processing. So these libraries are sort of built on top of the core Spark engine and Spark engines can be run on different processing uh, this, the core Spark engine can be uh, run on different processing engines such as we've got Yarn we've got Mesos we've got uh, Docker Swarm then we've got Kubernetes then within the major cloud providers AWS has an has uh, EMR GCP or Google Cloud has data proc Azure has data insight HD insight sorry and the most famous one is Databricks and these are all uh, the processing engines within which you can run the core Spark framework and use Spark uh, to uh, perform transformations and operations on your data. So let's just go to the the important features of Spark which are and the benefits of Spark over other big data frameworks specifically Hadoop. One is that it is uh, much faster than Hadoop thanks to its RDD based design. The second is it, allow, it allows developers to use their preferred programming languages with APIs available to them in Java, Python, Scala, and SQL. And the last is its advanced analytic and streaming capabilities. So it can handle near real-time data processing thanks to um, the Spark streaming library. It can handle uh, machine learning uh, workflows with MLib, graph processing workloads, and with graphics and also advanced analytics thanks to its ability to use uh, SQL with Spark SQL. And apart from this, we've sort of seen that Spark is built on top of a processing engine with the ones we had listed, such as uh, Databricks or AWS Azure uh, and the like. But below that, we need a file storage system as well. So in common use cases, the file storage system uh, would be a Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS, and we would run Spark on top of HDFS as the processing and data interaction layer. So this is the common methodology which is used nowadays in big data workflows. Uh, with cloud providers now who are coming out with their own data lakes and data file stores, that is slowly changing. But uh, HDFS with Spark on top of it is a common big data workflow. Now when we come to um, PySpark itself, uh, we ask what is PySpark after all this. So as mentioned earlier, Spark had some APIs for interacting which is with its core uh, Spark engine in multiple language languages and one of those languages was Python. So um, the Python API for Spark was referred to as Python Spark or PySpark. So I think that should give you a sort of a good overview of uh, what is PySpark. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you have any more questions, comment or send them to us at the email in our description. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment. And we'll be looking at setting up an environment to work with Databricks, uh, to work with uh, PySpark and Databricks for free in the next video. And then we'll be diving deeper into PySpark and some of its uh, functionalities. So we'll see you then. Thanks for watching.